you could say that unless you're making these yourself, you need a source. I love the idea that there are men and women all over the Maritimes that have a guy for Lady Ashburn and Pickles. <laughs> and without being too presumptuous, that guy is typically someone's nana or grandma. <laughs> no points for anyone. <laughs> this is fun. Round of applause, everybody. Let's <laughs> take a little rip of this Alpine while I have the opportunity. And I understand you know a lot about Bob Stutt. <laughs> Who? <laughs> you know, Bob Stutt, the puppeteer. I thought you guys were like friends or close or? Um, I, actually, I think your script there says legendary puppeteer, John. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So first off, of course, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional unceded territory of the Willistic Way people. And, you know, it's so important to finally be able to come together and see this amazing show. I'm so excited because for the longest time I was like, who is this person? <laughs> what do they look like? I know I was like, is it a couch potato? Is it, uh, who is this person? I just, I had a vision in my mind and I'm so excited because it meets nothing of what I had pictured in my brain. Um, so, again, uh, we've also gathered here for Shivering Songs 2023, thank goodness, <laughs> it's come to fruition, it's so awesome. Um, we want to thank our presenting partners, Craig's Auto Clinic, Brunswick Financial, and the Details Design, give it up, woo! <laughs> and a big thank you to our platinum partners, The Cap, Asante Wealth Management, and Tri's Truck Center. Uh, and of course, what? Well, yeah, let's give it up, give it up, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> and we also want to thank the Charlotte Streets Art Center for having us. Woo! <laughs> You'll find the bathrooms, artist merchandise, and more in the like right out here in the lobby as well. So let's uh, begin. And um, I'm actually gonna bring a, a friend from Edmonton, a fellow friend. Uh, you may know him as Roly Pemberton, or better known as Cadence Weapon. <laughs> Woo! He's gonna come and introduce John. How's everybody doing? So I, I knew I, I had to do this for the special mon monumental night, Canada.gov.ca. How am I connected to this mysterious figure? <laughs> it's not me. I'm not him. But the guy that it is, I, you know, I know him very well. We were roommates in Montreal together. And I, I'll never forget, you know, when I first met this guy, the first thing I thought about him was, man, he can really talk a mile a minute. <laughs> oh, my God. Unbelievable. Just a torrent of conversation coming from him. But a lot of enthusiasm and positivity around it, you know? And what, what, the thing he would talk about more than anything was Canada. <laughs> this person, I was like, he really loves Canada on a level that I'd never seen before. And not just the country but the concept of Canada and just the ideas around it and the iconography and the kind of bric-a-brac of it all. I was like, okay, yeah, you can talk about this. He introduced me to all this random Canadiana, like uh, what, what is the game uh, that he plays? Uh, Crokinole. <laughs> He's like, hey, you want to go play Crokinole? I'm like, uh, what is that? And he had to teach me that. And uh, another thing, he... Uh, he would always talk about Canadiana, but then he would uh, always mention, you know, he had this English degree <laughs> that he was going to use someday. And I realize now the connection was made where this is it. This is it. This is the, the culmination of all these things. And then he, w one day, you know, makes this, you know, Instagram page, and it really takes off. It takes off to the point right now we're looking at, almost 56,000 followers on Instagram. <laughs> and it's got, me, it's got me thinking, 
damn, I should have made a meme page instead of being a musician. Oh, my God. <laughs> but, you know, you're in for a treat. This guy is a very special guy. He um, hosted uh, my wedding recently. Honestly, I'm serious. Uh, he's a very near and dear friend to me. And without further ado, the wonderful, the amazing, Canada.gov.ca. Really to do that uh, because I was like, no one's gonna nail it better than this guy, um, and that was great. Thanks, thanks, Rolly, wherever the hell you are. Um, hi everyone, my name is John Bat, and I'm the admin behind the Instagram account Canada.gov.ca. I can't believe that I'm here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, doing my first ever live presentation of my account at the beautiful Charlotte Street Art Center. So perhaps there are some of you that are not entirely sure what's going on here, so I'll just fill you in a little. Exactly six years ago this month, I started an Instagram account while working an office job in Montreal. I chose the name or Instagram handle as it's technically called Canada.gov.ca because it was available and I thought that that was funny. <laughs> so I began by just posting arbitrary photos of the Canadian countryside and before long I was posting more humorous photos pertaining to Canadian culture and arts and history and it took a while but the followers started to trickle in. By the time I had somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 or 1,000 followers I decided that perhaps I could take this platform more seriously and start doing more quote-unquote deep dives about aspects of our country that I find funny and interesting. And it was as I took this approach that more and more people decided I was worth following. At that point, you know, over the past six years, I've amassed 55,000 followers who for some fucking reason are interested in what I have to say every week. <laughs> it has been a wild ride. Uh, before I go any further, I'd like to say how neat it is to be here specifically at the Charlotte Street Arts Center. For those that don't know, this was initially an elementary school built in 1885. It was erected to replace an elementary school that was over by the barracks in Officer Square. And to make an, a connection to Shivering Songs, that's of course where they have like the snow dome igloo for this festival. Uh, which is hosting some shows. Uh, but the building itself, it's the oldest primary uh, school remaining in Fredericton. And no doubt, no doubt, if these walls could talk, they'd have a lot to say. So for me, that's pretty cool. And it's extremely fitting that my first ever public de delivery of this account is here in this space itself. I mean, it reminds me so much of St. Dunstan's where I went to elementary. Like, I'm standing up on this low stage... <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, of course, I wanted to have this event at another venue. I initially asked to host it at the co-op, but I couldn't remember my co-op number. <laughs> so that was, that was a real shame. <laughs> then I wanted to have it at St. Dunstan's, my, my elementary school, but of course the people living there did not agree to that. <laughs> so that was also unfair in my opinion. All that to say that I'm pleased to have this historic space as a consolation prize. <laughs> Can't believe I wrote this. What the hell am I? 
I couldn't be happier to be here with all of you, and I hope that this 60-ish minute presentation is as rewarding for you as it inevitably will be for me. <laughs> the idea is to deliver a couple of posts, as they're known on the online platform, <laughs> in a live setting. With that said, I'll go over three or four topics that I'm guessing will be as uh, interesting to you as they are to me but I'll also leave time for some closing remarks and questions if there are any. I'll also be tying in some audience participation along the way, uh, you know, some trivia that may or may not include some prizes. So without further ado, I thank you for all being here. I'm excited to get into the slides and discuss a few things that I hope we all find neat. <laughs> oh, that's not. <laughs> That is not supposed to be there. Can we get, can someone move that one? <laughs> ah, fuck. <laughs> like, how do, I, how do I change slides? Oh no, that's not, that's not supposed to be there either, I don't think. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay, I think, I think that is for sure the last mistake. There's no way there's another, oh my God. <laughs> I'm sorry, he, he's our hero. <laughs> we, we all love him. Okay, all right, all right, we have it figured out, okay. Sorry about that, everyone, that's super embarrassing. Um, I'd like to start with a pretty fun little topic here, and I chose it because, you know, for a few reasons. It's nice because on my account, people get really fired up about food and recipes and shit, like people get really mad in the comments, I'm <laughs> blown away. Um, but it also has a really amazing connection to my hometown of Fredericton and the, you know, the backstory is nuts. And that's what the account is all about. It's about exploring the forgotten why of certain Canadian details or stories that we may or may not take for granted, you know? And so that's kind of what I'm, what I'm up to. Um, so let's talk about Lady Ashburn and Pickles. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people realize that the recipe of this famous relish comes from right here in Fredericton. <laughs> Secondly, there's a very maritime-ish type love story behind the whole thing, and I personally find it all very endearing, and I'm hoping everyone else does as well. So let's start from the beginning. Who was Lady Ashburnham, and what are Lady Ashburn and Pickles? I should begin by mentioning that to many, they're also called Lady Ashburn pickles and other times called Lady A relish. In my own home, my mother calls them Lady Ashburn pickles. I think some culinary authorities might say it's a mustard relish, usually yellow in color and a hearty liquid typically served out of a jar. <laughs> now, and, and I kind of touched on this a minute ago, but I run the risk of upsetting people here because I've noticed one thing about posting food on the account. It can be very polarizing. <laughs> if people even suspect you as posting a recipe as fact or the right way to do a certain dish, you'll receive a lot of fiery and feisty feedback. <laughs> and it's like malicious. <laughs> like it's insane. So please keep in mind, as I present this, it's potentially one way of doing it, and I'm very sorry if that's how your Nana or Grammy didn't do it. <laughs> According to my newbrunswick.ca, which is an amazing website, by the way, <laughs> a website that I love very, very much, you want to start with six large cucumbers, peeled with seeds removed and chopped to a quarter to a half inch dice. I've also read that they can or should be towards the end of their ripeness, meaning they've turned yellow. The other ingredients are as follows. A quarter of a cup pickling salt. Maybe I should switch slides here. There we go. <laughs> uh, four cups onions chopped fine, two and a half cups white vinegar, two cups sugar, three tablespoons flour, one tablespoon dry mustard, a tablespoon turmeric, a teaspoon mustard seed, a teaspoon celery seed, and I think that's it. So here are the instructions from the website. 
cut your cucumbers and onions into small pieces and mix together in a large pot. They use a food processor for the onions and then they cut the cucumber by hand. You add salt and to the cucumbers and onions and then you let it sit overnight. The next day you drain and you rinse the salt. Then you add the remaining ingredients. Cook over low heat for 45 minutes, making sure to stir the pickles often. Carefully pack into hot sterilized jars and wait for the pop and then enjoy. So how do you eat them? Well, you serve them on a tiny dish. I think I have a picture of that. There we go. <laughs> this, is, this is my mother's Lady Ashburnham pickles dish. <laughs> so you put them on your plate with the tiny spoon, and you place them next to your ham or turkey or whatever else is being served at the family party. <laughs> and they're not typically consumed by like scooping them up and eating them by themselves, but rather most people would eat them by putting them like on top of the meat or something else and then eating them that way. But I am not here to judge. You can eat them however the hell you want. <laughs> but a few more interesting tidbits about this relish before we get into the corresponding love story. You can't buy them at grocery stores. So before you head to Costco or Sobeys to pick these up, keep in mind you're much more likely to find them at a local country market. You could say that unless you're making these yourself, you need a source. <laughs> I love the idea that there are men and women all over the Maritimes that have a guy for Lady Ashburn and Pickles. <laughs> and without being too presumptuous, that guy is typically someone's nana or grandma. <laughs> In fact, there's been some controversy about the whole thing. In 2018, CBC published an article on Christmas Eve of all days <laughs> with the headline, Homemade Pickles Pulled from Store Shelves in Grinchy Government Crackdown. That's the most fucking New Brunswick headline I've ever <laughs> read in my life. I'm living in Montreal and I'm reading this. I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's another couple one-liners that I would like you to that I'd like to read from the uh, article. It's a real pickle <laughs> for fans of New Brunswick's signature homemade pickles. And then another woman goes. We don't live in Toronto. This is a rural place. I think we should be allowed to eat pickles. <laughs> so I'm not... <laughs> I'm not... I'm not... <laughs> I'm not sure who could argue with that. Like, she's right. You know, sh we should be able to eat pickles. Um... <laughs> I'd also like to shout out uh, the journalist behind this article because I'm a big fan of hers and she's a follower of the account uh, and her name is Julia Wright and she's the host of Information Morning in St. John. Yeah. So it remains a bit of a mystery why the Department of Health was trying to get, you know, <laughs> homemade pickles pulled from shelves. Um, <laughs> You know, my mom has bought them for many years from Cochrane's Country Market in Rosse. <laughs> yeah. um, perhaps the government was trying to protect the supply from larger companies such as Bix, which makes a similar sweet mustard relish. But that just seems unfair, and many have said that they are not the same. <laughs> yeah, so... There's, there's lots of drama here already. <laughs> um, so now we've established that these are a cult favorite, you know, native to the Maritimes and specifically to Frederick, New Brunswick. So what's the story behind these? Who was Lady Ashburnham? And she's up on the screen now. Here's where, it's get, he, here's where it gets fun for me and hopefully all of us because it goes back quite a ways, all the way to 1858, when a woman named Maria Elizabeth Anderson was born in Fredericton. While her given name was Maria Anderson, she was known to her family friends, well, family and friends, as Rye, like R-H-Y-E. Uh, in case there's any confusion, Rye would later take the title Lady Ashburnham, and here's how that came to be. Around the turn of the century, around 1900, a British Army officer named Thomas, Thomas Ashburnham 
settled in Fredericton. His father was the fourth Earl of Ashburnham, and Thomas was the fifth of seven sons. Thomas was a young man and would spend his evenings in Fredericton drinking and gambling. Love this guy. <laughs> Instead of trying to stumble his way home and being a man of considerable wealth, he would end his night by calling the operator in Fredericton and asking for a horse and carriage to take him home. <laughs> the night operator who would almost always answer his calls was a woman with an extremely pleasant voice and kind demeanor named Maria, AKA Rye Anderson. Over time, Thomas Ashburnham developed a crush on his operator <laughs> who would take his calls <laughs> and arrange his horse and buggy. This is true, it's insane. <laughs> the man had never seen this woman, but he fell in love with her voice. And inevitably, he asked to meet her in person. I would also like to think about this from Rye's perspective. Every couple of nights or so, this man calls. <laughs> and, you know, maybe he sounds handsome. Or he sounds even better, rich. Right? <laughs> or both. So it's hard to get inside of, like, her head about it. But she agreed to meet Thomas Ashburnham in person. And we know that this happened before 1903 because it was that year that the two met, fell in love, and got married. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm trying to think of a modern version of this. Some guy goes down to Dolan's every night. <laughs> he plays the VLTs. He calls George's taxi. <laughs> eh, I'm at fucking Dolan's or whatever. Going to North Side at $5. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or whatever. <laughs> so now Rye becomes Lady Ashburnham, and, she and her knows, she and her new husband, Thomas, buy two houses on Brunswick Street and have them conjoined by what's called a port cochere. And that is a painting of the house. Pretty cool. From what I gather, it's like a loftish catwalk that could join two houses but left space for a carriage to pass underneath, right? You can see. The houses, I believe, are still there on Brunswick Street. The current addresses are 163 and 165 Brunswick between North Umberland and, and Smythe. Uh, a little bit run down now. In fact, I think I can, yeah. <laughs> But that's where Lord and Lady Ashburnham lived. <laughs> they had no children, and they were known to be quite the Fredericton socialites, hosting huge parties every Saturday night. The story takes a funny turn here. So you'll remember how I mentioned that Thomas Ashburnham was the fifth of, of seven sons. That meant that it was very unlikely that he would inherit the title of Lord Ashburnham, given that there was four brothers ahead of him in line. But as bad luck would have it, Thomas's four older brothers all died. <laughs> and he was called back to Britain to, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry, I'm going too fast because I, I should have left time for a reaction there. <laughs> they all died. What the hell? Four of them? And so he has to go back to, like, the UK and assume the title as the sixth Earl of Ashburnham and Viscount St. Asaph. And in 1914, the two left Fredericton, so Lady and Lord Ashburnham, and moved to the family estate in Sussex, England. The thing is, Rye, or Lady, or Maria, however you want to think about her, didn't really fit in with the whole English <laughs> nobility thing. <laughs> she was a maritimer. <laughs> and she was considered to be a little rough around the edges. <laughs> so I don't know if the George's taxi analogy worked or not, but I can certainly see this still being the case if you took any kind of maritimer and dropped them into that scenario in this day and age in, you know, fancy UK culture. 
Given that his new bride was not comfortable or really accepted in England, they kind of pulled a Harry and Meghan and took off. <laughs> <laughs> and they headed back to Fredericton to resume their life as a happy couple with no kids and throwing parties on Brunswick Street. <laughs> I, just, I just love this. I think it's so insane. So sadly, in 1924, they're going back to England on a white star liner which was the same company that the Titanic was. Uh, and Thomas became very sick and died of pneumonia when they arrived in London. He left Rye, or Lady Ashburnham, a yearly allowance of 2,300 pounds, which is about 181 grand Canadian dollars today per year. So not bad. Pretty <laughs> re re reasonable. <laughs> she, she was probably stoked. Um... <laughs> I, I would be. <laughs> so, do I have any more slides about that? Oh yeah, that's, that's Ashburnham Place in Sussex, England, where they would have tried to move into, <laughs> but it, it didn't work out. And um, this is where they got married, um, which I think maybe I mentioned. Let's start reading. A few maritime historians, such as Dorothy Stewart and Sharon Fraser, would like you to know the following. Rye was famously pretty useless in the kitchen. <laughs> and when she came into her luxurious lifestyle, she hired her younger sister, Lucy, to run the kitchen on Brunswick Street. So it's actually well documented that these aren't Lady Ashburnham pickles at all. She just got credit for serving them. The real genius. <laughs> See, this is what the account's all about. Like, let's get to the fucking bottom of this shit, right? <laughs> the real genius behind the recipe that has stood the test of time is Fredericton's Lucy Anderson, her younger sister. Yeah, let's give it up for Lucy. Because, like, credit where credit is due. And I may be the first person to ever be giving Lucy the credit that she deserves for these pickles, right? So next time you're serving them alongside your hammer turkey, maybe let someone know that they're Lucy's because I think she deserves at least that. <laughs> so we're going to get started with a little bit of trivia. And we're going to get some audience participation here. In order to ensure that no one looks up the answer on their phone, we're going to go by who raises their hand first to answer the question. And also, just don't cheat, you know? <laughs> um, I say here that I'm going to have a pen and paper to keep score, but I, I don't. I, do, I didn't do that. <laughs> so the first round <laughs> is focused kind of on my hometown here at Farrington, but it also may involve what we now know as Acadia, or Nouvelle France. So here we go. Who is the longest serving mayor in Fredericton history? <laughs> Who? Brad it is Brad Woodside. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Who is that? <laughs> All the way at the back? Yeah. Okay, C uh, count one for yourself, please. <laughs> 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 Who is the first female war artist in Canadian history? <laughs> That's everybody, <laughs> shit. I was trying to kind of make it a little hard, but how do you not shout out Molly Lamb, Bobak, the most brilliant artist to maybe ever come out of uh, the city? It, her work is absolutely amazing. O on New Year's Eve, yeah, sure. <laughs> on, on New Year's Eve, I posted her painting First Night, which maybe some of you are familiar with. And I don't know where people are. They might be skating or whatever, but like, her work is just so nuts, and it inspired, like, Michael Corey, who is another famous, well, favorite artist of mine in uh, Fredericton, who my sister Laura Bat worked with, and, um, yeah, I don't know how you don't name drop Molly Lamb in a show like this. So that's question number two. Can number th point <laughs> Yeah, point for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> point for everyone. Thank, thank you, my sister Maureen. <laughs> Question number three. 
Fredericton has a little famous statue, older than the Statue of Liberty. He was once stolen. <laughs> and the one that hangs around downtown by City Hall is a replica. He is particularly fond of a certain fountain. What is his name? It is Freddy the New Dude. <laughs> no points for anyone. <laughs> this is fun. I'm hav personally having a great time right now. <laughs> Before the Fredericton Canadians, the city was home to another AHL affiliate far <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> it was players from this team that gifted the city the nickname Freddy Beach. Does anyone know that story? Like, how did we get the nickname Freddy Beach? It's funny. Okay, I'm going to go off script here and tell you. So basically, you know, like the answer is the Nordiques, right? The Nordiques had their farm team in Fredericton as the Fredericton Express. And it, yeah, choo-choo. I actually have a, a train whistle, which was merch for the, for the team. Like, like, yeah. Um, but basically, they named Fredericton Freddy Beach to make fun of us. And it was people that were... Uh, members of the Nordiques, and if you got demoted to Fredericton and you had to come to Fredericton to play for the farm team, the players that were not being demoted would say something along the lines of, oh, you're going to love it. Like, you're going to love Freddy Beach, implying there was like a beach. Or <laughs> there's obviously no beach. <laughs> it's, there's a river, <laughs> which I wouldn't swim in myself. Unless I was at uh, Pete's Cottage. Where's Pete? Yeah, unless I was at Pete's Cottage in, uh, you know, in Wellsford or that area, I might, I might jump in the water. Brown's Flat, New Brunswick. Thank you. Shout out Brown's Flat. Shout out Beulah, too, while we're at it. Um, so, yeah, so that's where Freddy Beach comes from. It was people who are not from here who were basically, like, shitting on us. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know. Like, I remember going to King's Place and seeing the stores that had, like, the Freddy Beach merch. <laughs> like, we all, like, we yeah, we had it. <laughs> like, we wore it. We're like, yeah, Freddy Beach, it's great. And it, the, the origin is that people were, like, ruthlessly making fun of us. <laughs> and I turned it around. Yeah, exactly. We, we owned it, right? <laughs> um, final question. No points for anyone again. <laughs> Final question. When Samuel de Champlain landed in present-day Port Royal, Nova Scotia, he was greeted by a Mi'kmaq chief. Approximately 71 years earlier, the same chief greeted Jacques Cartier when he arrived on the Miramichi. Historians have estimated that when that chief met Champlain, he was between 110 and 120 years old. What's the name of that Mi'kmaq chief? Wow. Sandy Hunter. That's a Mi'kmaq. That's the correct answer. It's member two. Everyone, round of applause for Sandy in the front row. I forgot the trivia time slide. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of just going with the flow here. All right, here we go. The coffee news. It's 1999. You walk into a little diner after school with a friend. Most of the clientele are smoking De Maurier or Exporte Blues. <laughs> you grab a copy of the coffee news and you sit down. The waitress comes over and calls you honey or sweetie. A grilled cheese is 150. The little jukebox at the booth has achy breaky heart on it and life is good. The idea was simple, news to enjoy over coffee. And goddamn, if that's not exactly what it was, <laughs> but there's a little more to it. Oh, shit. I went too fast. <laughs> the coffee news has its origins in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Creator Jean Daum decided that she wanted to create something as addictive as sugar, but much more nourishing for the mind and the community. <laughs> it's a weird quote. I'm not, I didn't write that. That's... That's what she said. <laughs> After months of research and compiling uplifting stories, facts, trivia, and horoscopes, the groundwork was laid for what could be the coffee news in editions across Canada. Of course, with the rest filled in by local, small, and medium-sized 
business advertising. Pretty soon you could find the coffee news at any worthwhile diner across the country and eventually other countries as well. And I don't think people realize this, but it literally is all over the world, which is crazy. So that's the genius behind it. It's always local. And with that strategy, the coffee news began to franchise and in 95 made its way to the United States. By the 2000s, it had spread to Australia, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Poland, South Africa, and Spain. <laughs> the coffee news is now read by 5 million people worldwide every week. Yeah, it is crazy. <laughs> the largest weekly restaurant <laughs> publication in the world. <laughs> I mean, that's a niche category, I guess, but... I will still always grab one whenever I see one and keep it because they're little pieces of history frozen in the present. Something other people have pointed out regarding the coffee news. There's apparently a little man in every edition that you have to try to find. I didn't know this. And when I was like doing the post, I was like, you know, I did the post and the, the comments started rolling in. And everyone's like, oh yeah, the little man. I'm like, the little man? What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but yeah, apparently there's a little dude and you have to find him every single time you, you pick up a coffee news. Um, yeah, well, that's that sentence. So <laughs> 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 what I think is neat about the coffee news is that much like my account, a seemingly small idea turned into something much bigger for its creator. Round of applause, everybody. <laughs> Let's take a little rip of this Alpine while I have the opportunity. It's also something that seems extremely local to all of us, and some of us have obviously mistakenly assumed that it was only in our hometown. And that, in and of itself, is a sign of its authenticity. The idea was to take this larger objective idea, but make it subjective to the town that it was found in. Some of the things in them were nationwide, like jokes, limericks, trivia, but the local ads, I think, are my favorite part. I wonder if I, oh, damn, there's the diner. I keep fucking this up, so. <laughs> but, you know, the, the limericks and that and all that stuff is funny. The ads are amazing. And commercials in any form, just like any kind of other art, exist as this time capsule for the time. It's often remarkable to see what was kosher to say in an advertisement 30 years ago versus what might be the strategy to sell something today. And I'm gonna switch to this as an example. Suddenly, she never looked prettier. And I don't even wanna leave that up because it's not super chill. <laughs> so I'm gonna go back. Um, imagine running that ad today. Very misogynistic. <coughs> it makes you wonder what kind of ads are running in our current coffee news that will be considered offensive in 30 years from now. <laughs> like, I wonder about that. Like, you know, because they didn't see anything wrong with, you know, she looks great after a bunch of beers. <laughs> but, and there, there's reason to be upset about that. <laughs> The coffee news is also a neat little element of diner culture in Canada, which I believe is a big thing both here in and in the United States. I was certainly a little diner creature when I lived in Fredericton with specifically the Sunshine Diner and the Cabin. For me, first, the, the, the Sunshine Diner. And I don't know if you guys know the diner. I'm sure a lot of people here do, but yeah. But somewhere on the menu, there was all these little like tricks to like how to order things. Like it'd be like, put a hat on it if you wanted like your eggs a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't make any sense, but you had to, <laughs> you had to like look at this <laughs> and be like, throw it down the river. And that meant like, <laughs> and that meant you wanted like your toast. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> to me, that is funny. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Um, I call myself a little creature. <laughs> and I was also kind of a diner guy when I moved to Montreal. 
But going out for breakfast at some iconic spot in the morning after going out was almost as important as the night before. I used to get a lot of diners. I used to go to a lot with old friends of mine in Fredericton, and we would mimic the old timers in there and their classic moves. Nothing quite like being called sweetie, honey, or dear when you're hungover. But it's as rewarding to see some old fella do the resisted burp, like, Or when some other dude, like, aggressively wipes things away from the side of the mouth, like. <laughs> so me and, my, me and my buddies at inopportune times would do that to each other just to, like, throw each other off. Because like <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> so there's the cabin. There's, there's me. There's my wife, actually. <laughs> and, oh yeah, there's some of the ads. You know, Peaches and Cream, Beautiful Light, Tiffany Studios. So in every town, they're personalized, or, well, you know what I mean, regionalized, which I, which I find interesting. Um, so yeah, the coffee news is legendary, and I hope everyone considers some of these fond observations the next time they pick one up. Thank you very much. Clap, please. I was on the internet not long ago and I saw someone post about these funny looking UFO type buildings called Futuro Houses. So I see this post on Instagram. You know, I said, <laughs> there are a few cute versions of Futuro Houses in the Maritimes. The old pizza place turned curling rock in Moncton, and of course, the famous UFO gift shop at Rainbow Valley in Cavendish, Prince Edward Island, as I'm sure we all know about. So I was feeling very smart, smug even. The world is a better place for my little contribution to the comment section of this Instagram post. <laughs> well, I was immediately corrected. While those two structures are featured on a few different Futuro-focused websites, they are in fact not authentic Futuro houses. How could they not be, I wondered to myself. And finding out that they were knockoffs was almost worth embarrassing myself, and I will tell you why. What is a Futuro house? A Futuro house, or a pod, is a round, prefabricated house designed by Finnish architect Matty Serona. Fewer than 100 were built all of which during the late 60s and early 70s. The shape, UFO shape, and the structure's airplane hatch entrance has made the houses a collector's item. The Futuro is composed of fiberglass reinforced polyester plastic and measures four meters and eight meters in diameter. They were initially meant to be little ski cabins. The problem was people thought they were ugly as hell. <laughs> <laughs> and many municipalities actually banned them. And so they almost ceased to exist pretty abruptly. <laughs> Most of the ones that survived were not residential but ended up being businesses. So sorry for getting carried away. We should get back on track. Um, for the longest time, I believed that the two Futuro houses in the Maritimes were repurposed, but like I said, the truth is even stranger. Given that an authentic Futuro is prefab or prefabricated, there really are the authentic official ones, and others that were built by licensed builders. For example, Bombardier was given the plans and permission to build one in Mont Blanc, Quebec, at, at a ski hill. That's this one. The one in Moncton and the one in Prince Edward Island were both very, very impressive knockoffs. So with a little digging, I was able to learn that they were both built by a, na by a man named Earl Davidson. Davidson was the genius behind Rainbow Valley in Cavendish, Prince Edward Island. Round of applause for Rainbow Valley. <laughs> if you are from the Maritimes, you are more than likely familiar with Rainbow Valley. So, Earl Davidson just fired off a few Futuros by himself like it isn't hard? <laughs> Am I naive to be crazy impressed by this? I always just assumed that the same had been done in Moncton, but the one in Moncton was actually first, and it was a pizza delight. And in 1980, the Air Canada Silver Broom Men's World Curling Championship was held in Moncton, at which point it was repurposed into a giant curling rock for the occasion. <laughs> so in 
So I had them in the wrong order. So that was when it was Pizza Delight. Imagine, go and, go and getting your garlic fingers in that. <laughs> On Ma Mountain Road. Is there anyone from Moncton here in the crowd tonight? <laughs> Don't boo my, you know what, okay, I'm, I am sick of this shit. I'm not from Moncton. I'm from Fredericton, but we, why are we shitting on Moncton? It is so lazy. Like, what, do we work for this hour is 22 minutes? We're going to shit on Moncton? Moncton is great. The people from there are great. And get a new joke, everybody. <laughs> well, whatever, man. Moncton is sick. And the people that are from there are dope. And um, I'm tired of it. And like, it's the same as like shitting on New Brunswick if you're from Nova Scotia. Like, sir, you're from Yarmouth. Why are you? <laughs> tell, tell me how great Bedford is, bud. <laughs> you're going to shit on New Brunswick? Forget it. I'm over it. I'm over it. So <laughs> back to this post. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell if I'm the only one who cares about this whole thing, but some of the old Rainbow Valley rides and artifacts can be found across the street at Shining Waters in Cavendish, and other items can be found at Earl Davidson's son's business, the Haunted Mansion in Kensington, Prince Edward Island. But where did the UFO go? I have a few Rainbow Valley merch items myself that I sourced from the gift shop at his son's place. Um, but I don't know where the UFO is. Although there is like a weird YouTube video of someone that thinks they found it like out in the <laughs> woods near Kensington and they're taking a, a clip of it. It's super creepy. Overall though, PEI is like scary in general. You know, you go to that, you go to the haunted woods when you're a kid, you're walking around near Lucy Ma Montgomery's uh, grave and you're like, this is all insane. <laughs> Why is this a thing for kids to do? I don't know. <laughs> but, it, but it is. Um, anyway, I'd like to shout out my mom and dad and my sisters for all the fond memories that I have going to Cavendish Prince Edward Island every summer. We're back to trivia. In 1996, Donovan Bailey won the gold medal at the Atlanta Olympics for the 100 meters. He also set the world record in the process. How long in seconds to two decimals did it take? That is correct. <laughs> that is super, you know what, in fact, who is that, Pete? Come here. Here's two full-size oven subs and two cans of pop from Greco. In 1970, former UMB student Anne Murray hit the top 10 in Canada with her massive hit, Snowbird. Who wrote the song, Snowbird? Who? It's Jean McClellan. That's impressive. I, I'm loving this. This is great. <laughs> give, give yourself almost a point. <laughs> Who? Oh, what's her name again? Yeah, and she does some of his tunes, eh? She's from Prince Edward Island. Yeah. So he moved from Toronto to PEI because he was trying to escape like being famous. Yeah. And he then he was like a guy that would go to like prisons and play for like before Johnny Cash was doing this. Gene McClellan was going and playing for inmates. Like he was a Christian. He had uh, this whole thing about being an artist. Um, anyway, super interesting guy. <laughs> Look up Gene McClellan if you ever get a chance. What city boasts the title as the first capital of Canada? No, St. John was the first town, incorporated town or city. What's the first capital of Canada? Kingston, Kingston is right. <laughs> Kingston, Ontario is correct. That is minus one point for Sandy. <laughs> well, I mean, so Fredericton was the capital because St. John was too vulnerable. And that's probably what happened with maybe Kingston and Ottawa. Do you want to do this fucking thing? <laughs> I'm kidding. This is a 
good friend of mine. Don't, <laughs> don't think anything else. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> the governor of New Brunswick maintains a rustic lodge which operates as an exclusive resort getaway for politicians and friends of the government. What is golf? She's right, but I'd like to um, drag a few politicians in the mud while I'm at it. <laughs> Guests have included people like retired general and chief of defense staff Rick Hillier, former host of The National Peter Mansbridge, creator and producer of SNL Lauren Michaels, and Moosehead CEO Andrew Olin. But in the last couple of years, visitors, visitors included people like Minister of Post Secondary Education, Training, and Labor Trevor Holder, Mayor of St. John Donna Reardon. Moncton South MLA Greg Turner, Fredericton York MLA Ryan Collins, Minister of Natural Resources and Energy Development Mike Holland, Social Development Minister Dorothy Shepard, and Tourism Minister Tammy Scott Wallace. What's the name of this lodge where all of our famous representatives are hanging out? It's Larry's Gulch. Larry's Gulch. What's the second largest city in the Yukon? It's all, it's all connected, right? <laughs> Anybody? It's Dawson City. That is five points for the guy in the back. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to continue with trivia, actually. Who assisted Crosby's golden goal in overtime at the 2010 Vancouver Olympics? Oh. Again, is correct. What's the largest lake in the Prairie Provinces? It's Lake Winnipeg, actually. Did anyone say that? Yeah. Losers. <laughs> the Saskatoon Airport is named after which Canadian Prime Minister? Stephen Baker is correct. I heard it over here. That is seven points for that gentleman. <laughs> Due South was a famous television show in Canada from 1994 to 1999. What was the name of the actor that played the Mountie? Paul Gross. Paul Gross. Yes, let's go. <laughs> Wasn't he handsome? My God. All right, and now there's a microphone here. I want to see who can come up and name five of Canada's Grand Railway Hotels. <laughs> Who's it going to be? Let's go. Who is it? Bunch of babies. Come on. <laughs> I, got, I got them all here, so whoever it is. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll take five. Ron, come on up. Can you let him out? Mom and dad. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ron Jessen, my grade seven homeroom teacher. Everybody. <laughs> Can you check to see if the mic works there? There we go. All right, Ron, what do you got? Uh, Bamp Springs, Jasper Park Lodge. Um, <laughs> this is where I go. Um, uh, York. Um, Toronto, Toronto, New York, yeah. in Toronto. Yeah. Um, Quebec City Chateau. Chateau Frontenac. Yeah. I'm sure is what you meant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working for him here. Not Chateau St. John, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Ottawa, the, the Chateau Laurier. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Jessup. Ron, Ron, don't, Ron, don't go anywhere. Come here, Ron. I have um, one sinful bite from Greco Pizza. <laughs> so, for those of you that follow my account, you're aware that I'm keenly interested in what some would call the overlooked aspect of Canada, or anything. Of course, you can Google whatever you'd like and find out the what but you have to be specifically interested in something deeper to find out more. Something that's about finding out the why, which is something we so often forget to ask ourselves. More importantly, how often do we remember to Google the who? And I think that's what makes me so interested in the next topic because it's something that kind of came across my desk accidentally. In the past, I've been asked to promote companies you know, do sponsored content on the account. When you get the followers that I have, that's what happens. 
It's not something that I want to make a habit of doing, but when this particular company reached out to me, it was all about this vintage Canadian cartoon merch that they were making, and I was essentially put into a position where I realized that doing content for for them was going to be as interesting for me as it would be beneficial for them. I found myself researching shows that I grew up watching religiously as a kid. Shows like Under the Umbrella Tree, Mr. Dress Up, The Big Comfy Couch, Sesame Street, specifically the Canadian counterpart, which was known as Sesame Park. And I was having a great time looking all this stuff up and doing my quote unquote deep dives uh, that I do and it was nice because, you know, you made a lot of money doing this. <laughs> but I kept getting assaulted by this same name over and over again, and the name was Bob Stutt. And after I looked into him more and more, I realized that this guy was essentially omnipresent on all shows that I grew up watching. He played some part in so many of them. As a puppeteer, as a writer, I was just thinking to myself, who is this legend, and how did he end up doing this job, and where is he now? So with that said, I thought I would tell everyone a little bit about this unsung hero, Bob Stutt. If you're looking for specifics, allow me to drop a few examples of the kinds of things you might find on his resume. Let's start with the big comfy couch. <laughs> he puppeteered as Molly, Snickle Fritz, and Fuzzy the Dust Bunny for about 100 episodes. Remember Basil the Polar Bear on Sesame Street? That was him for 160 episodes. He was also Gilbert the Cat on 53 episodes of Caillou. <laughs> He's worked, yeah, that was a funny reaction because everyone was like, ha ha, ooh. <laughs> He's worked with Jim Henson on a number of projects, whether it was the Miss Piggy special, the Muppet Christmas, or which he co-created Fraggle Rock. <laughs> he played a bunch of different characters on Fraggle Rock on 96 episodes, and if you're so far not convinced of this guy's legendary status, I am not sure what to tell you. The Friendly Giant, today's special, he was there. But perhaps most importantly, Bob Stutt was a writer, voice actor, and puppeteer on one of my favorite shows, playing Iggy Iguana on Under the Umbrella Tree. <laughs> the guy was working in TV and film for over 40 years and wrote, there's Bob there on the far right. So he was a writer, actor, puppeteer on one of my favorite shows, blah, 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 sorry. 40 years, wrote over 300 scripts written by CBC, Disney, and PBS. 300, that's a lot of work. I think it's kind of fascinating how we have these kinds of people out there that just put in all this time and played such a role in our childhoods, especially in this case, the childhoods of Gen X and millennials but in some way they go a little bit unthanked, or rather I should say is that I believe they should be household names, but because they played strong roles literally behind the scenes, the household name thing just doesn't come quite as naturally. I would certainly argue, however, that these characters, like the characters themselves were household names. And I would certainly argue that Molly on The Big Company Couch, Iggy Iguana on Under the Umbrella Tree, Basil on Sesame Street. Like, Basil was basically like the Canadian Elmer. Like, he was on every show of the, of the show. So, anyway. Um, I was really hoping to have Bob Stutt here with us tonight, but when I reached out to his management, they said he was not available. Boo. But then they were like, yeah, it's something about witness protection. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to ask anything more about that. But they did connect me with the world's leading Bob expert, although I'm a little skeptical. So please hide your disappointment and give at least a smattering of applause for Professor Iggy Iguana. Hey, hi, John. Hi, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much. No, no, please, take your seats, take your seats, please. <laughs> thank you. No, sit, sit, please. Um, Iggy, they're, they're already sitting, actually. Hey, puppetry is all about imagination, John. <laughs> <laughs> so, Iggy, are you a real professor? Oh, sure, yeah, I once did the stage play of Gilligan's Island. 
And I understand you know a lot about Bob Stepp. Who? <laughs> you know, Bob Stepp, the puppeteer. I thought you guys were like friends or close or... Um, I, actually, I think your script there says legendary puppeteer, John. <laughs> yeah? Bob Stutt. No, not ringing any bells. Sorry. Uh, Iggy, this, yeah. this, this guy. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Mr. Uh, cold Hand Up the Butt down there, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we go way back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm losing my mind right now. And I'm not wearing any pants. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you do this? All right, um, Iggy, what can you yeah. tell us about Bob Stutt? Well, let's see. What can I say about Bobby that uh, I haven't already said many times behind his back? Uh, <laughs> well, certainly I can describe his puppetry career in one word. Over. You know, John, Bob is a guy who started out with nothing, and he still has most of it. <laughs> he likes to consider himself a real wit, and his close friends will tell you that's half right. <laughs> you know, John, Bob and I, we actually don't see much of each other anymore. He, he and Joanne are having too much fun with Emmett and Ricka and Jessica and Pete and their world's cutest grandson, Jack. Round of applause. Yeah. Yeah, well, I keep myself busy lying dead in a gym bag. <laughs> well, well that, that at least sounds cozy, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Anyway, John, I got to go. Stutz arm is killing him again. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I'd like to wish you all the best with this uh, Instagram thingy you got going here. I, I'd love to see it sometime, but, well, John, hey, you know all about parole officers and Internet access, right, John? <laughs> but seriously, folks, before I go, I always like to toss a shout-out to all the people who help put on weird events like this. The little people, I like to call them. Whoever they are and whatever the hell it is that they I do. I don't think you should call them the little people. Eight. Anyway, tonight I'd like to bring up one of the most important figures behind the scenes, someone you never get to see, my stagehand. And uh, wh what's his name, Iggy? Oh, um, Mr. Harry Palmer. Mr. <laughs> Harry Palmer, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> anyway, John, that's it for me. Hey, hey, you want to see something really neat? Watch this. It drives him crazy. Watch this. <laughs> <I don't laughs> no. Uh I don't, I don't think you should do that, Iggy. Okay, thank you. Wow. Okay. Oh, thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Professor Iggy. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Stutt. So um, the Muppets have a little trick they, they do using, or during mass auditions, um, where they ask for six volunteers to come up on stage and grab a puppet, and we're going to give you a 10-second audition to see who's in and out. We you need six people. You want to do that now? we want them now. Well, look, test, test. Oh, no, where were we, we going to go No, through? let's do it now. We can do it now. Um, this goes back to 1981. I was a puppeteer living in Toronto. i have been doing puppets for a while. Today's special, stuff like that. And uh, the Muppets had done the Muppet Show in New York for five years, or in London for five years, most popular show in the world. And they decided to do a new show in Toronto called Fraggle Rock. So they put out a cattle call audition, which means anybody can come. Now, there was only about 
12 of us in the whole country making our living off of puppetry at the time, so <laughs> they were looking for 11 people. I figure I'll go down. <laughs> so I go down to Sumac Street, and uh, there's 450 people there. Every actor, every clown, every juggler, every magician, every puppeteer, we're all there to audition for the Muppets. But I quickly realized, um, well, after the fact, that the Muppets, this happened to them all the time. Anytime they hold an audition, they get all these people. So they had a very clever way. Richard Hunt would do the first auditions, and uh, he would bring seven people in at a time and do this real quick little audition, and he would know instantly whether you were going to be a puppet star or not. So who wants to audition for the Muppets tonight? We, we literally want six volunteers. Laura's one. My sister, okay. come on up. Uh, I see, Nath is that Nathaniel? Uh, yes, please, come on I've up. I've got seven puppets here, I think. We have three. Um, who else? Yep, come on up. We currently have one, two, three, four. We need how many more? Two or three? So come uh, on, just, just, just get in yourself the in the mix. Yeah. Now, the one thing, these are just puppets I brought along. The one thing they all have in common is they have a movable mouth. Now, this one here is actually Fuzzy the Dust Bunny from the Big Comfy Couch. Yeah. Excuse me. Help yourself. Now, the, the cats, uh, sorry. Um, the, yeah, use anyone to the door. Excuse me. This is Snickle Fritz the cat from the Big Comfy Couch. And I brought him along because I wanted to show you that he has a stunt double. And this is... <laughs> and his nose fell off in the bag. <laughs> so what you would do uh, in the big comfy couch whenever Snick the Cat was running along and he would jump into Granny's cart or whatever, we'd take the stunt double, which is not, you can't put your hand inside of him. Somebody off camera would just throw him back there. <laughs> I'd be waiting backstage, stick my hand up with the puppet on, and we'd go from there. Okay, come on out front, everybody. <whistles> Spread out where everybody can see you. Welcome to the Muppet Audition. Everybody in a line? Okay, good. Everybody, puppets up. Okay, everybody look at me. I mean the puppet. <laughs> okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna count to 10. Count out loud with your own voice and we're gonna count to 10 with a puppet. And Richard Hunt, who used to do Scooter on the Muppet Show, do these auditions and he, wonderful. He, passed away now, but wonderful guy. So he would tell us all, puppets up, and let's everybody count to 10 together, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> eight, eight, nine, nine ten. 10. Now let's count it backwards. 10, 9, nine eight, eight, seven, six, six five, five, four, four Three, two, one. Okay. They all failed. <laughs> Bob, I thought you were going to get good volunteers. I thought though. I was going to. I think everybody could do this. Now, of course, you know what we're looking for? When you count to 10, you did. You did. Sorry, you passed. Oh, we you have did. one pass. Okay, one, one pass. And seven in counting to 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven is the only two-syllable word. So if you didn't open your mouth twice, <laughs> they would we thank you very much We didn't much run this coming. through, and I'm like, what the? Yeah. I'm mind blown right now. Yeah. Although, actually, um, what's your name with the hat? With the hat on? Matthew. Matthew, and I hate to center people out, but it's, and it's, not, it's a dyslexic thing or something. Some people have. And they, clo they go, one... Two, three, <laughs> four. Matthew, he doesn't mean to yeah. do this. And I, yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah, we're related, actually. So, I, it was funny because I, when when Bob and I were talking about doing this volunteer thing, he goes, "The only danger is if someone had a dream of being a puppeteer, <laughs> and we, <laughs> and we crush that dream on stage." And I was like, well, "What are the chances of that?" Yeah. You know. Like, yeah. Probably pretty low. Okay, you can put the pups back and <laughs> take the rest of the night off.
All right, Bob, why don't we go through a couple of slides here, and you can okay. tell me a little sure. bit. Why don't what you, you grab one of those chairs, I'll and you can just put here. it in the middle. And um, I'll, I'll grab one myself here. Uh, another standard puppet thing in is uh, to save time when you're shooting is uh, if you had Iggy and he had his tuxedo on, <laughs> and in the next scene, he was Mr. Casual, <laughs> then you just pull out another puppet that's <laughs> in a different outfit. <laughs> Actually, his head comes off, to change, you could change bodies, and the arms come off if you want to redress them. So when I first had my, my daughter Jessica, who's out here, um, I'd come home exhausted from work and try and pull her arms off to change her in a little... <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. What do you think? Should I? Should we start with the slide that's actually on stage okay. right now? Sure. Um, now, does anybody here remember the Friendly Giant? <laughs> okay. Well, Mr. Rod Connie Bear did Jerome and Rusty, Jerome the giraffe. Rusty, you can just see above his nose there, uh, the chicken. And then every fourth show was a music show, and we did Cats in the Music Room, Angie and Fiddle. And I would usually do one of those, but in this scene, I'm actually doing um, Rusty the Chicken's cousin Dusty, th who came in to play the drums. <laughs> and he had another cousin, Busty, who only came up in rehearsals. <laughs> but we shot that show in a little tiny studio the size of this room, Studio 40 in Toronto. At one end was the Friendly Giants Castle. At the other end was Knowlton Nash's National News Desk. Wow. And every day they just turn the cameras Le legend. around. Legend, like you're shoot just name dropping the show. Like it's shoot nothing. friendly in the morning, and then shoot uh, uh, Milton Nash after. Uh, yeah, after. Ca casually. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. What about this? What's going on here? Okay, this is Fraggle Rock. Uh, we're shooting against blue screen here, um, and this, I just like this shot because it shows you how puppetry sort of works. Um, I'm holding up uh, Boober, uh, that's me at the front, and behind me is, is Dave Goles with the headband and the beard. Uh, he also does Gonzo on The Muppet Show. And uh, he's Gonzo. holding up Philo. Now Dave normally does Boober, but because he's doing his other character Philo in that scene, he gave Boober to me, I do Boober the character, but Dave is doing both the voices for his character and for Boober in the scene together. And that's very common with the Muppets. And you usually, not in this scene, but usually you have somebody else doing, usually you do the head and the left hand, somebody else does the right hand for you, or the tail, or whatever. So you can have a, a scene with three people in and six puppeteers stuck underneath. So morning showers were pretty mandatory in those days. <laughs> uh, this is me and Jim Henson. Uh, with a character called Traveling Matt. The Jim Hansen. Yeah. Now, um, the, the nice thing about Fraggle was I was the new guy. So it was the same puppeteers who did The Muppet Show, but with different characters. Uh, Jerry Nelson and Richard Hunt and Dave Goles and Kathy Mullen and Steve Whitmire. So whenever Jim had to do a photo shoot, and he was always having his picture taken for a magazine or something, um, and the worst thing to do as a puppeteer is steal photos because you're usually crammed under a chair and holding it up for hours and it's no fun. So they would let me do the, I do all the still photos with Jim. So I got to spend a lot of time with him just hanging out and we both, we both love puppets and we both seen a lot of, I've been to a lot of puppet festivals, seen a lot of people. We love to talk about puppets together and um, so that's what I'm doing here. This is still still photo. Somebody's taking a gym, and, and I'm holding up the traveling mats. Mr. Dress Up, of course, Ernie Coombs. Ernie, Ernie Coombs. The most important um, part of my childhood, uh, actually from, I believe, Bangor, Maine. He was, he was from Maine. Um, his whole introduction to his career was he worked with Mr. Rogers. Mr. I Rogers came to CBC for the first season to shoot here, and Ernie was his puppeteer. That's right. He brought Ernie. And then... I mean, people don't know that. Fred Rogers went back to the States, and Ernie stayed here and put his own show together. And became the most amazing, influential uh, 
TV star of my entire childhood and, and everyone's childhood and in this room. Same with Friendly. Uh, Bob Hummy was an American who came up here too. Yeah. Um, I, I always like to say, you know, times have changed. Imagine trying to pitch Mr. Dress Up now. <laughs> you know, I got a 40 year old man who lives alone and yeah, invites it's so kids creepy. And <laughs> invites kids in to play with a tickle trunk. Yeah. But that's what was so crazy Thank you. and, and like actually kind of like, I don't know, in a way nice about it because it was like, you know what, you actually should trust some people. <laughs> and he yeah. was one of them. So yeah. I don't know. Like, don't maybe distrust every single person you ever meet. Well, I don't think you could pitch, I don't think you could pitch Sesame Street anymore. Yeah. Well, if you, you, would you said, know. I got a character that lives in a garbage can, they'd say, no. <laughs> I got a character who eats nothing but cookies. No, 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 no. I got a character who speaks in a strange European accent. No, no, you can't do that. Glory of the Gopher. What do, you, what do you got here? Glory of the Gopher. Noreen Young. Noreen Young created Umbrella Tree, produced Umbrella Tree, and starred as, as Gloria. I, uh, Th this character spoke to me. She was, yeah. like, the, like, the puppet itself was very uh, memorable. Yeah, as and Noreen is. Yeah. I, so was the host. And what was her Holly. name again? Holly the Rock. Yeah. And... Uh, the Blue Jay. Jacob Blue Jay. Is, is Jacob. Steve and Brathwaite, yeah. As I was researching the show to kind of do some promotional, like, spawn co and sponsor content, I'm looking over all this stuff again. And I think what people like about my account is they, al they always say the same thing, like, oh, you unlocked a memory. It's always <laughs> the same terminology. You unlocked something. Yeah. And that did kind of unlock something for me. Um, it was such a good show. It was so well done, and I well, don't what we did differently on that show, it was basically sitcom format um, for kids. Which, so is we which is funny. Like that's that we had in the three itself act, We had the B story. We had all that stuff. Yeah. But in terms of budget, we shot two 15-minute episodes of Umbrella Tree a day, and Fraggle shot uh, a half-hour episode, and they took seven days. So... Um <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I want to thank you so, so much. Like, was this not the highlight of the show? <laughs> I, I, sa I, sa I said to a few people that you were, you were going to save this. <laughs> it, it was maybe going to go south, but Bob's going to yeah. come in and... Well, I didn't expect anybody to show up, so I said, sure. <laughs> sure, I'll do it. I, I had to tell him what Instagram was yesterday, yeah. so... Yeah. Well, Bob, I'd like to thank you very much okay. for You're your You're welcome. Hey. Thank you. Um, I am happy and excited to leave a couple of minutes here for, you know, at the end of my first ever live presentation of my account. Um, but first, I'd like to make a few closing remarks. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone that works at Shivering Songs the Charlotte Shoot Art Center. Kate Hamill, specifically, I don't know if she's here. Um, you know, Dylan and Jason, who I met tonight, who were huge helps. Um, I'd like to also thank the big shot, Zach Atkinson. Because if it were not for Zach asking me to do this and proposing to take the account live, I would not have done it. So thank you to Zach for asking me to do it. I'd also like to thank my mom and my dad and my two sisters, Laura and Maureen, who are, of course, here tonight. Because <laughs> this is how we roll. And my fiance, Allison. It says here, hold for applause. So let's keep it. But honestly, I would really like to thank the followers of this account, Canada.gov.ca, because the followers are the most important part. My mother, on many occasions, has said that the comments are just as good or better than the posts themselves. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> but she has a point. The hive mind element of the comments, you know, where I start a story and the comments essentially finish it, in addition to all the successful posts that have been suggestions by like-minded followers 
who are keenly aware of what I should look into. Like that, that's, that's the main thing behind it all. And without that, I don't have this account. So thank you very much. <laughs> we, we live in a funny time and in a funny place. I feel as though we are collectively rejecting the neatly packaged version of the Canadian identity that we've been fed by the beer companies. <laughs> we are so much more than hockey, maple syrup, Mounties, and moose. There's a lot more to our story, and more and more we are realizing that white settlers are such a small part of it. And, <laughs> and immigrants, newer Canadians, and our, sorry, I'm not supposed to say our, the indigenous people of Canada are in fact much, much more important to the overall story of what we call this country. <laughs> so with that, thank you so much for coming. If anyone has any questions or comments about the topics tonight or the account, or the account itself, let's hear it. But um, maybe let's do it at the merch table. Uh, right over there, come say hi and buy a shirt. Thank you very much, this is amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.